get fairly quickly to Dinesh Das Sabu. Das Sabu. Uh, welcome to Live from the Heartland, Dinesh. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're, you're a longtime Chicagoan. Yeah, 15 years now. About half my life. Yeah, not that long time. Well, yeah. Uh, I, thought it's you were old, I thought you were older than you look, my it's man. All, it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> it is that. It is that. Well, um, darn it, it doesn't always happen this way, but be easy. Beat us to the punch this week. They got you first. We often get, we get people first. I think they listen to us. I think I was, often. we were trying to do last weekend, which would have, you guys would have done it, but it didn't work out, so. Right. Um, so you had a big opening last night. Yeah, we opened at the Gene Siskel Film Center last tell, night. Tell us about how that went. This is the film that uh, Dinesh is here to talk about, Unbroken Glass. Yeah, so my film, Unbroken Glass, opened at the Siskel. Um, it was really an incredible experience. Um, just, uh, you know, I co-produced the film with Cartunguin Films. And they have such a wonderful community of supporters, but we also were able to get, uh, reach out to the South Asian community and just the public at large to screen the film. Excellent, and it's and it is zeroing in on your community, your home community. Right. Uh, the story is um, my journey to piece together my parents' story. They passed away when I was really young, and the film follows me as I go on a journey to figure out who they were. Um, I made it to adulthood, and I had this giant gap where my parents lives and that story and that connection should have been and ultimately I just I I couldn't take it anymore and I decided to pick up my camera and start talking to my siblings and my extended family wow and how old how old were you when your dad passed I was six and they passed away about a month apart right right how traumatic and then you and your siblings basically raised one another? Yeah, we kind of banded together. My eldest sister was... So I was, I was lucky because I was the youngest of five siblings. Of course and, you were lucky. <laughs> and we my, all know about the baby of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and so my eldest sister was 21 at the time. And she became uh, my and my brother's legal guardian. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of banded together and raised ourselves. And it was the kind of thing, it, was, it, it felt... It was felt uh, totally natural. Of it wasn't until I became an adult and I came, I went away to college that I realized that, hey, not everybody else had similar childhoods, right? That's not what college else. is for, right? <laughs> Absolutely. College is for seeing the rest of the world and suddenly going, oh, my mom really can't cook, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, you talked about having this gap of not really knowing your parents because you were so young when they passed. Right. When you started the project, what did you think you were going to discover about your family? So I should say I had a thumbnail sketch of their lives. It wasn't a it wasn't a complete question mark. Um, I knew the basic facts about their emigration from India. Um, my dad was this uh, really brilliant uh, scientist for a while, um, and I and my mother suffered from schizophrenia for most of her life. Um, so I knew the the basic facts about their lives and their how they died. I really didn't know what to find, what I was going to find out. I think it was an effort to maybe paint a picture of them as fully formed humans, as adults. I think most adult children, you know, you get to this age and you, you meet your parents as, as equals. You, mm -hmm. you kind of realize, like, hey, these are complicated human beings whose lives are affected by all kinds of social forces and responsibilities, etc. So I think that was kind of what I was hoping to get at. But I didn't know what form that was going to take until I picked up the camera. Wow, I want to find out the end of that, whether or not that's what you actually experienced with the end of it. I think so. I think so. I mean, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of work, and I had some really great collaborators. Um, my editor, Matt Lauterbach, my camera person, Ian Kibbe, and all the folks at Cartoon One Films who just really uh, rallied around this film and supported it. Um, and I think through working with them and this collaboration, um, I was able to delve into my personal experience, but also contextualize it in the way I think a good documentary and good art should should do, um, and understand, you know, all of the, the or not maybe not all of the complexities, but just the, how complex you know these people's lives are and lives in general are. You know, the the space that you did have the both in time and in memory from your parents probably helped you make a, a real documentaries, documentary filmmaker film yeah. out of something so personal. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is 
those of us who have our parents all through our lives, we never see them as equals. <laughs> we might greet them as fellow uh, adults, right, fully right. formed adults, like you said, but equals doesn't quite do it. Exactly. There's always this kind of relationship. There's still mom and dad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But just to your earlier point, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I don't. I couldn't have gone on this journey any younger than when I started. Uh huh. You know, we there was this silence, and it was a survival method. Right. Sure. It was just the events that we all experienced collectively as a family. They were just too raw. It was just too painful to really delve into immediately after, in the years afterwards. And so silence became a way of coping, mm. and it was a way of surviving. And it got us through a couple of decades. But it ultimately was untenable. Ultimately, I was carrying all this stuff around that I didn't even know about that I needed to explore in the film. So you got all your siblings at one point or another to talk to the camera. Yeah, at and, least once. Each. And and yet, as the film develops, you have at least one brother who says, "Enough, right. I can't do this anymore." Right. I don't want to make too much of your earlier comment that he decided he needed to go back into a silence. Or well, had, had you pinpricked a little bit too much around his security it, blanket? It's a really complicated scene. Um, I think the I think the way I originally looked at that was oh yeah this is just silence perpetuating itself, but I realized after shooting it and after um, you know the space of a couple of years that you know my siblings dealt with this in their own way we all kind of came to terms with these things in our own way I just happened to choose a very very public way to do it making right. a documentary that was going to be shared with with the world so I think he was. Thinking about that in addition to some of these other things. Sure. I should also say that, you know, I am, you know, making a personal doc. You're both a filmmaker, which is an incredibly privileged position, which with a lot of power being behind a camera. But you're also, in this case, I'm also their baby brother. Mm -hmm. And so there are these two kind of valences of identity that I'm navigating just in that space. Hmm. So that, that scene that you mentioned with my brother. You know, I probably took liberties and were given liberties as a, as a younger brother that maybe tipped the scales as a filmmaker, and I think it was a kind of way of writing the ship a little bit. Uh, that's well said. To, to what extent, because I have not seen the film uh, beyond the trailer, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it down there. Um, to what extent do you look at the, uh, the inequalities of the sexes, the genders, in uh, particularly in India, where your, your dad, dad went back to collect his wife. I assume that was somewhat un prearranged? Yeah, it was a traditional arranged marriage mm -hmm. within our caste. Which, some of which work beautifully and people go on and have incredible family yeah. histories forever and ever. And then there's others, um, and particularly from a woman's point of view, if you look historically at uh, mad women, Absolutely. Um, you know, to what extent do people uh, get either undiagnosed or simply grow into a sort of mental illness for lack of uh, room to move, sure, room sure. to be who you are? Those are those are two really incredible points. I think it's it's important to acknowledge that the history of mental illness, especially in communities of color, uh, has often been a mechanism of social control. Um, uh, and you know, smarter people than myself have written and talked about this. Um, that being said, in, in in the experience of my family, it's you know, it was really incontrovertible what what was going on with my mother. Just the the level of psychosis and the hallucinations and, and delusions. Mm -hmm. um, it's impossible to divorce that from the context of her as an immigrant. And just to connect that to your earlier point, um, the film is really, you know, we decided to make it very, very organic, just in terms of my per, my experience going on this, this journey, kind of um, uh, girded by these, these montages with photographs and voiceover. So there is, there is an exploration of what's happening with, with respect to gender inequality in, especially India, in that uh, generation. It's not, it's not overt, right? I don't come on the camera and just kind of, you know, start talking about that. But you can tell that, you know, the, the, the opportunities that my father had access to and then my mother, just vastly different. Sure. And, you, and that plays out in the film and also my exploration. 
So that's and the really interesting thing is, you know, both of my parents were from this generation that of, of Indians who really reaped the, the benefits of independence, of a, of a newly independent, optimistic India, as well as, um, a, I think, a really wonderful uh, immigration policy that was passed in 1965 in this country. That's very, right. Very liberal immigration laws that attracted you know, talented people and people seeking freedoms. Um, and my father was able to come to the U.S. and study. But my mother was able to come to the U.S., but she did not, because of, because of her culture and context, she did not have access to the, to the same opportunities in the same way. Well, and because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that affected what kind of support and treatment she could get for the mental illness that she had to deal with so much of her adult life? I, 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 I'm absolutely sure it played a role. And, you know, it's... Putting this story together, it was you know there are a lot of holes. So there are some things that we just won't know. So I do know that she was diagnosed and did have some treatment in India. But beyond that, it, you know there are not a ton of records, and we weren't really able to find out much about it. But again, like these things, you know, exist inside of a very very complicated social context. So when my mother, when my there's a period in the film and in my family's history where my father moved my family back to India. And that's where my mother was diagnosed and where she received treatment. Um, they also happened to, you know, when they moved back, they were living in what's called a joint family. So this is a, a social arrangement uh, that was, that's really common in India where um, a kind of a central patriarch kind of um, uh, owns this house and all of his sons and their wives kind of live together collectively. The extended family. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there's some real positive, incredible things about it, especially in the context of this very individualistic... Child care. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Child care, housework, mm -hmm. kind of so socializing children, especially compared to the individualistic kind of American context. At the same time, it can be incredibly restrictive, especially if you are, like my mother was, a really bright, very independent woman who had just lived in, in the U.S., in the West, for several years. I and can't just imagine. Yeah. She, yeah. And what uh, what year, when did they move back in terms, in relation to when uh, she passed? This was in the um, late 1970s and the early 80s, was that, chap that chapter in India. So and she passed away in uh, 1991. When were you born? I was born in 1985. So were you born there or here? No, I was born here. Oh, okay. So. All right. So I know you're looking at a particular uh, cultural, uh, ethnic, geographic, as well as this gender lens that we've already been talking about in terms of your mom and your family. But as a documentary filmmaker, what have you learned, and someone who's lived in Chicago, about how we deal with mental illness in our society yeah. today? You know, we had a, an early screening of just, I think, you know, rough scenes of the film, and somebody stood up and said, Look, it's not just India. No, no culture deals with mental illness Amen. particularly well. Amen to that. Um, and you know, the film has the potential and is addressing uh, issues of stigma and silence in the South Asian community. But it also, I think, has broad applicability to just the general public. Um, and we've screened this with very, very different audiences and gotten very similar feedback. You know, people will stand up and share their own stories and talk about the silence and the stigma and how pernicious it is in their own family, sure, regardless sure. of their backgrounds. And uh, I, I guess I want to follow up with Tom's, on, as, a, as a filmmaker, um, what did you come across in the making of this film, and assembling it, that absolutely surprised you? There were a lot of incredible surprises. Cool. And, um, you know, there there's... Um, there are a couple of really big revelations that occur, you know, uh, a couple of times in the film. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. Don't I'm not give, them give them away. Right? away. Come, come down and see it at the Siskel. Mm -hmm. But um, and you see me learning these things on camera. Really. And some of them are just really quite kind of incredible. Um, but I, I would say just to generalize, um, there was a moment where I realized I found a photo of my parents, and they must have been, this was in my late 20s when we were editing the film, and they must have been like my age in this photo. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them and I was like, what? They're like, they're like peers. 
and I and I, I just looking at this photo, I was I, I got the sense of the well, it was a combination of the of, of the research of the film and understanding their just how complex their lives are and just how they like me, we're just making things up as they went along, just like <laughs> right. everybody else. Like all of us. And yeah. I never realized that about my parents. I never made that connection of them as, as people. Interesting. You're listening to documentary maker Dinesh Das Sabu, whose film on broken glass has opened at Siskel Center, which you can see all week. I'm Tom Clark, along with Katie Ogan. I'm live from the Heartland. We have a few more minutes to find out what you hope your viewers not only will learn about your family, but what will they take out of this film in terms of their approach to these complicated family dynamics and when Other something issues. like mental, in mental illness drops in the middle of it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there is some very, very um, direct work I want to do with the film in terms of confronting stigma, like we've been talking about, really breaking the silence around um, mental illness and talking about mental health in a variety of communities. In addition to that, though, you know, the film talks about so many other issues in this intersectional way, surviving suicide, childhood trauma, um, and I think there are some really exciting things that we're going to be doing around those issues. That being said, I'm always shocked by people who have very, very different uh, backgrounds than I. They'll watch the film, and they might not have an immigrant, uh, uh, you know, past or a family history of mental illness, but ultimately they can connect to the film because it's about a family. It's about, you know, surviving just life and, you know, family relationships. And that, I think that's a real universality. So my hope is that people, that any audience member could really get something out of this film in terms of thinking about their, their own, the relationships in their own life. You're also riding the crest of an awareness buildup in this culture of Indian culture. Yeah. And filmmaking in, uh, in general out of India. I just saw a Lion. Oh, cool. Which was very cool. Yeah. Um, and I also just read something I'm going to uh, suggest you check out in Granta magazine about post postmodern India. Oh, cool. It's, yeah. it's a real deep article. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that on radio, but uh, go read Granta. No, I'll, and, I'll check it out. Uh, in addition to that, um, Indian American and Asian American culture, hmm. there's this real uh, flourishing. It's it, that's right, that's right. We've got uh, Raja Krishnamurti from uh, the 8th Congressional District being yeah. a congressman now. There he you go. took over Tammy's old seat, and he's a wonderful guy. Um, very attentive to the current uh, crises facing us. I, you know, when I've seen the film, I want to urge our listeners to not be put off by mental illness or schizophrenia or, you know, someone, uh, uh, you know, ending life early, because the way you explore this with your family, dare I say, is um, I almost want to use the word delightful, because there are these surprises. Yeah. That's a great. These, point. these moments of self-revelation and the way you've constructed it along with the Gartemkin. It's, it's not your dreary documentary. Yeah. It's a slice of life that yeah. over five years is very, very rich and, and, and there, rewarding. And there's a lot of humor there, too. There it's, sure is. It's impossible to tell a story like this um, without humor. And um, yeah, I, I think. And, and I think your siblings deserve a lot of credit putting up with you as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you don't even know. Lynn, Lynn yeah, I, I just wanted to say I didn't see the film yet. I've watched the trailer and I've uh, looked at a lot of the media on it. And I think it's, a, it's such an important documentary. Thank you so much. And that um, this film can be used as a platform for mental illness, for communities of color. And that I hope that conversation through Cartemquin and through you can be open to universities and to students for them to see the film and, film and to open that conversation. Yeah, the, the really interesting thing is, you know, we've been, we premiered uh, in October and I've been screen, traveling and screening the film for a few months and I didn't realize just how eager the community was for a film like this. We're getting emails from all over the place organizations already exist and they want to screen the film and have these conversations. So all week at the Cisco Center, the film is Unbroken Glass. You need to catch a plane, Dinesh, so I thought we'd let you take off a little early here. Um, but congratulations on a, a wonderful project and we wish you the best of success on it. And all right. good luck continuing your discoveries. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you for having me. It's our pleasure.